I think every scientist cares. And I think if you care, you know, you, you're curious and you also love. So I think, I think the curiosity that is innate in the scientist comes from the caring and the appreciation and the love, truly. This is the Livable Future Podcast. I'm Katie Barker, co-creator. And in today's episode, I sit down with environmental consultant, artist, and community facilitator, Emmanuel Vital, to talk about how we can bridge the gap between science, sustainability goals, and communities. I would like to start by acknowledging that we are creating this podcast on lands that were traditional and ancestral homelands of the Ute, Arapaho, and Cheyenne people. We would like to honor these people and their contributions to this region. So, Emmanuel, could you tell us your scientist origin story? How did you get into science and how did you get into what you're doing now? Yes, I have to go back. Um, I... I'm from France originally, so I studied, um, I was in college in France studying engineering and computer science, and I came to the U.S. as an exchange student. I think I was very curious about cultures, uh, very young, and really had a um, desire to travel and learn about um, different ways to do things. And in doing so, I came to the University of Wyoming and studied uh, career science, artificial intelligence, and really uh, fell in love even more with the outdoors. And I wanted to actually switch my studies to natural resource management. At the, end. At the time, there was no multidisciplinary fields. And um, I ended up taking courses in ecology, in rangeland management, in water management, and and I, um, I received a master's degree in land use planning and geography and really tried to learn about as many disciplines as I could. And then um, I practiced and worked internationally through the Office of International Program at the university. And uh, what I did, actually, I helped um, researchers work on um, sustainable development projects. And in doing so, um, I also wanted to, um, I, I decided to continue my um, uh, graduate studies and I went back to study watershed management. But I think I really uh, kind of switched just my <laughs> academic or scientific um, interest in really wanting to start to bridge the gap between the research and the practice. In working for um, you know with sustainable development agencies such as World Bank, USAID, I really felt a gap between what was being researched and really what uh, people needed on the ground. Since then, which is many years ago, I really tried to um, kind of facilitate that exchange of knowledge and uh, help develop not best management practices, but better practices. So I continue to do that today through my consulting work and also uh, research. For example, I had worked on a local project in Silver Springs on um, water management awareness in working with local artists and water decision makers to really bring uh, water management awareness and support nonprofit organizations who are working in conserving uh, water in the region and community members who actually want to be involved. So I created an art and science exhibit with the support of uh, NEST at Sea Border, which is the uh, Nature, Environment, Science and Technology Studio for the Arts. And after the exhibit, I received many inquiries from other communities who wanted to do something similar in regards to the conservation of the uh, bringing awareness to water management for their own uh, rivers. And I decided that 
I really couldn't replicate exactly what I had done for the Yopa River community, but I really wanted to help them create their own projects. So I partnered with Patrick Chandler, who um, is uh, doing his PhD at CU, and together we created guidelines for decision makers, for community members, for artists to actually partner and work together towards their own environmental and uh, social justice issues. So I feel like this is, again, kind of an example of how to bridge the gap between, you know, the the research, the science, and, um, and communities. What do you think it is about art that really has the power to bridge that gap? You know, I think the the connection and the emotional component, I think that is very much universal. I think it's extremely powerful. And I believe that this experience that you can share for the art is much different than any kind of scientific theory that people can learn about. It's truly connecting, you know, people from the from their heart to nature in terms of environmental issues and to each other in terms of social issues. Yeah, art has been sort of the driving force behind a lot of movements, I feel like. Yes, exactly. I think there's a, we have recognized a need for, you know, what we call creative communication in terms of climate change communication. I actually attended a training just right when COVID started at the uh, Biosphere 2 in Arizona, which was led by a chapter of the UN and Judy's Bicycle in London. And actually, the Judy's Bicycle is a, a nonprofit organization that has been very influential in terms of creative communication and also uh, sustainability in the art industry in Europe and is actually now um, branching out to this training that I participate. Very much focused on using the arts to communicate the science, but what really, I think, taking it at, at another level, because I think that has been done, what I would like to contribute to is truly a partnership where the artist also brings in you know, their expertise, their interests at the same level as the scientists to truly create something new together. And not just using the artist to communicate, you know, the the results of the science, but truly working together on how to engage communities. Could you describe the art exhibit for us in Steamboat, sort of what it would be like to walk through the exhibit? As you kind of traveled through the exhibit, it started to identify all the decision makers in different ways. The theme throughout the exhibit was a water drop. So the water drop was used to for images and also text. So you, you started by really celebrating the collaborative management aspect of water conservation. You know, I think when you think about uh, agriculture, ranchers, you know, are very concerned about having water for the crops, for their Practices, agricultural practices, when you think of uh, recreationists, they want river in the water for a better kayaking experience. But truly, the importance is to work together because you cannot just focus on one aspect of what you use. So I really wanted to, to bring people together. When a rancher walked into the exhibit area, I wanted him to just feel recognized and also celebrated, as well as recreationists. And also showing everyone that, you know, obviously there's multi pieces, multiple pieces to water management, and we all have to work together. So that was kind of the first introduction. It's like, oh my God, we're here together. And really everyone was represented. And then we moved through, you know, the issues, the historical issues and the, the today's issues. And of course, going through an acknowledgement for, you know, the true stewards of the land, original stewards of the land, the native nations who lived here. So I think they was really trying to celebrate the historical stewardship and the today current stewardship. And then, of course, addressing different issues. We had also different hands-on stations where 
kids and different um, people of all ages could have interest in participating and touching and, and creating together. And then walking through the exhibit, uh, at the end, there was uh, a series of, like he said, actions or projects that people could engage in, presenting through different narratives, through different ways people could engage and actually commit to uh, help with a project on the ground or specific research or an artistic project. On the community level, what are those contributions that people can make? For example, um, there's River Cleanup, which is very long term. It is, it's, it's not really the issue, but I think it engaged, you know, at least the youth in respecting the water and understanding where uh, pollution goes to. And then at the larger scale is really understanding, you know, the, the challenges of water conservation at the state level through you North know, Colorado uh, Compact, through different uh, water policies that are being in place and also uh, agreements that have been made a long time ago that we still have to respond to. So it's not just about um, making new policies and laws. It's actually really trying to make sure that we satisfy and we respond to the agreement and, and, and working together to, uh, to compromise. I think people in our community have understood that, you know, we have the reverse flows on a regular basis, you know, when the water flows are too low because the water temperature increased and fish are threatened. So we, there's an event that is organized every year to plant trees to actually uh, create shade. And it has been proven scientifically that the shade that is provided through vegetation cover helps cool down the river and therefore keep fish happier. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's just different um, projects and, and solutions that the community can contribute to. So at different, different level, you know, fire mitigation, drinking water comes from uh, Fish Creek Canyon, as you know, if a fire occurs in the canyon, of course, that would affect drinking water. The community members don't even know where that water comes from. So being aware of that, you know, just simple fact, I think will help people be more cautious about not causing, starting a fire. So I think just linking, I think all, you know, water land management and, and, and really uh, trying to create this kind of a more holistic approach and understanding for people to understand that the actions at home while recreating really can affect water, for example. And that that does come back around to affect them, because I think one of the challenges about climate change is that it's a little abstract. If you're not living in an area where you're already experiencing severe drought or severe weather patterns, or you, there's a lot of climate refugees, then you don't actually see climate change happening in your day-to-day -day life. You don't see that it's affecting you now. Exactly. It's not so remote. Yeah, I think this kind of, you know, art exhibit or scientific exhibit, you call it, really help people understand how they are part of the solution and it's not something remote. The actions are important. I think that's another cool thing that I see about art is that it is empowering in a way that graphs and figures just aren't. When you see that fam now famous graph of the atmospheric carbon dioxide skyrocketing in the recent years, that feels very big. And like, what can I do about that? But art, art makes it personal. Yeah, and it's very daunting. And I think also, you know, uh, those kind of exponential graphs or numbers, I think the public is getting a lot of numb to it. So they can actually participate in something that they co creating with neighbors, with friends. I think there's a sense of uh, contributing to something, to the solution. And whether it's something small, whether it's, uh, say, replanting trees, 
in their uh, riparian areas. But I think there's a sense of being helpful. And I think, as you said, mentioned earlier, that positivity is important because I think you can just freeze. And I think the art project like that, I think allow for people to engage. And in, you know, with the talents that they have, they don't need to learn something new. They can contribute to a local project and, and that might inspire, you know, more action, more awareness. And, and I believe that um, art, like you said, kind of just meet people where they're at. Absolutely. I agree. And obviously, you invest a lot of your time and energy into this. You co-lead the art, science, and action program at CU, and you're a part of the arts and science partnerships for Boulder County. You're involved with art and science in Route County, where you live. You're a senior advisor for the RISE Sustainable Travel Institute, the founder of Pure Inspirations, and also run your own business and your mom. How do you have time for that all? And how do you stay motivated? I think I stay motivated by working with people like you who inspire me and, and have the energy to do, you know, to research and, and keep going. And that is always ins- inspiring to me. And I think it, it will always be because I think I keep learning. I keep learning how to bring people together and either create new projects or promote initiatives, like I said, that responding to the need of specific communities. So I think it goes from working in, in a place-based project to also uh, keeping a global perspective. You know, I, I partner with researchers from around the world. Currently, we, we are working on how to help local government, local actors to work uh, more specifically towards the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goal, and scaling up their initiatives and actions. And I think that's something that, again, the art and science, but really the science communication and the, the support of a local initiative can really, really be important. Um, I truly feel like that the SDGs, this universal framework, are important in communicating, having, you know, having a shared language among communities globally. But I think at the end, the local actors on the ground are left with the burden to actually make it happen. You know, we know that corporation and government have to change policies and, and be active, but really local government, uh, communities have to figure out on their own. And that is very difficult. <laughs> I think that's where the, the true work is and also the most difficult, you know, to change practices, uh, to change behaviors. So in the, the work I do at more policy level and research level globally, also linked directly to the art and science work that I do locally in terms of enabling communities to create change, to engage their members in sustainable practice. So I think it goes both ways. And I think it's important to create the SDGs, kind of a universal framework that everyone can relate to and, like you said, feel like they're contributing to something bigger. But at the same time, it's important to create guidelines that can be adapted to very specific, small-scale local issues. So I like to work in kind of those both realms, in the very small, place-based project and also keeping a a wider, larger perspective. And I I feel like you do as well. Absolutely. Um, I love that. I'm on the same page. And that's what I love about the SDGs, actually, and those programs with the UN and FAO is that they are both global and local. The UN doesn't tend to just like come in with these like big outside agencies as much as they tend to try to partner with the local groups to say like, who is going to ultimately protect this forest, not this outside entity, the people who live here are, and who is most invested, who's going to be most impacted by the loss of this forest, ultimately the people who live here. Yeah, I think it goes both ways. I mean, I think the SDGs are very important and hopefully a 
a great framework and motivators for corporations, you know, <laughs> to change their their practice, you know, to become truly net zero or reduce their emissions. And I think that really hap- needs to happen at the policy level. At the same time, like you said, the, the local actors need to be supported. But I think it's important to actually translate that language and those goals into something that really is appealing and bring people together at the local level. So um, people feel like they can uh, make progress and have measurables that everyone can relate to. So I think there's work to be done, you know, as much as there's work to be done to bridge the art and science, and there's also work to be done to kind of bridge those, you know, larger goals to local goals. And again, I think this art and science collaboration can help. Definitely. I love your use of the word translation there. I think we can see in the American West, you can have this big conservation goal, but what does that actually mean on the ranch? And what does that actually mean to the kayaker? Yes. I think it's both translation and really finding a common language that doesn't isolate, you know, different groups. I think that's really, that's an art in itself. You know, to be able to communicate without jargon, to bring people to the table and, and really make sure that everyone feels safe and free to express themselves without feeling that they maybe don't know enough or be criticized or anything. So I think that communication piece in terms of translation and really finding common language in any of those initiatives and in bringing communities together and engaging communities is very important. And again, as we said earlier, art does that in some ways, right? It is kind of a common language. Yeah, I think so. I think that's another good point that around the world, we speak a lot of languages, but there are a lot of images and things that we can touch and feel that we can collectively understand without someone explaining it. Yeah, and then maybe also this, um, you know, cultural aspect that can be shared through the art that can cannot necessarily be be done through just language. You know, for for the uh, art and science guidelines, we interviewed many different experts, and including Native American scholars. It was fascinating and also challenging to truly understand or for me to really to make sure that I understood what they conveyed and, and the way they approach project. And one of the scholars uh, shared the, this notion of the will, which we actually uh, used with his permission as um, the illustration for the, the different phases and stages that facilitators of art and science fellowship can go through to make sure that the project is is inclusive and also efficient and has the intention that um, the art and scientists express. When this scholar uh, shared this drawing with us and this notion of this sense of time and really circular way to actually learn and then learn from project to project and that knowledge be kind of compounded in each project. It's not really a linear way. It's just a a circular way of learning through each project and experience shared among the partners and the facilitators. That illustration has been very useful and and I think more powerful than the words. I think that kind of, again, illustrates what we're talking about, that sometimes a design, a graph, or a way of looking at time, places from a different culture can help us uh, look at things and, and gain a new perspective on how to approach a particular problem. Yeah, I hope, I hope that that slowing down to look also at the art that someone else created or to start creating art kind of engages that ability to listen and to say, everyone doesn't see the world the way I see it. Yes, yes, so this notion of you know, the notion of like radical listening, you know. And I think I think maybe if you can it can be combined to really looking at things, you know, more radically or opening your mind, I think, really in doing art, oh you have to you have to be open. 
I think in, in being creative is, is, is the base of being creative. Otherwise, you're going to replicate the same thing over and over. So I think really the arts um, help one just open and, and you know, in order to be open to you, then you have to actually pause and listen to, you know, your, your own inspirations and hopefully others. Definitely. What do you say to people that think they aren't creative? You know, I think there's many ways to be creative. It doesn't mean that you have to do something with your hands. It doesn't mean you have to paint, I can paint or build. I think it's you have to be creative in just the way you think. You know, I think you can be creative by the way you talk to someone. You know, you can any creative is any change, right? If it's you create, you make you change. So you can change your behavior, you can change the way you talk. You can change the way you you drive, you walk, you can walk slowly, but you know I think to be creative is, is actually about about changing. Right? Creating is is changing something, creating something new. So I think it doesn't have to be in, in creating a beautiful art piece. It, it doing things differently. And I think we're all capable of doing things differently. To me, um, I found that opening actually uh, through my connection to nature. It's interesting. I have a, a tendency to kind of close up to different people who annoy me. <laughs> or not want to talk to people who have different political views. But then if I, you know, like if I spend time in nature and I think I soften and I connect, and I, by connecting to nature, I think I can I open my heart to other people with different views. So I, when I feel like I become negative or critical or resistant of other people's view, I think I spend more time in nature and then I'm able to go back and, and open and, and maybe cooperate better with others. I think that's true for me too. It's like nature refills my patience and my empathy. <laughs> Patient and empathy and also truly creativity. Truly. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, the, I know we know the mimicry in terms of sense, but truly for me, it is my source of creativity. You know, right now the, the rose is out on Wild Rose Trail, as you know, and just I can walk and close my eyes and that alone just inspires me, just the smell. So when we said, you know, someone is not creative, I think you don't have to necessarily see or be an artist or be a musician. You can just um, close almost your all your senses and, and, and smell and find inspiration in the mix of the smell of the roses and the woods. And that alone just inspires me. <laughs> and if anything, really connects you and, and, and bring you joy in really sensing the beauty of our surroundings. And I think the it sounds a little bit I don't know, maybe shallow to talk about the beauty, but truly, I think uh, beauty is most inspiring and I think has inspired human beings forever, you know, for to really do the best things <laughs> in, in society. So I think really connecting back to nature and, and connecting to that sense of beauty is important and again, gives us hope to, to find the solutions we need. And that appreciation for nature, I think, really help us um, contribute to initiatives and projects that help our communities be more resilient, adapt to climate change, and hopefully mitigate. It's also a good reminder of why, kind of the why of life, you know? How can we stay motivated to keep trying to do our best and Sometimes it's just appreciating how beautiful things are and that appreciating that there are things in this world that are so stunning that take my breath away, that I love, that I want to fight for. Exactly. Yeah. Just the, the magic of life, right? At, at all scale, at the microso microscopic scale to, you know, our friends, family, children. <laughs> So I think there's really uh, art all over the place and that's what connects us as, as human beings, truly nature and art and love. We forgot love. 
how did we came from science to love? <laughs> That's a good progression, right? Thanks for joining us for the seventh episode of the Livable Future podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. And if you'd like to learn more about art and science initiatives, please check out the episode resources on our website. Thanks. We hope you join us again soon.